Hey again, everyone. We're back for another little chat. Oh, what fun. I got the camera flipped around so I can see myself. And wow, my hair looks weird today. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so I am a giant movie nerd, right? And it's kind of funny because there are a lot I haven't seen, but then again, there are a lot I have seen, so it works out, I guess. I am a film school graduate. I remember thinking before I went, oh, hey, I'm going to have to watch a whole ton of movies because everybody there is going to be talking movies and there are going to be all these uh, film nerds like me and they're going to have seen all these movies that I haven't seen, so I better bone up on them, right? It wasn't like that at all. <laughs> like People liked the movies, but they, they weren't as big nerds as I was. So, <clears throat> like, they just wanted a job. Um, hmm. Which I don't quite understand. Like, if you're gonna... Especially if you're spending all this money in film school, which it was expensive. Even then it was expensive. Like, why wouldn't you... It's something you get into because you're passionate about it. Wouldn't you think? Like, you know, movies would be your thing. And, yeah. To, well, that's what I figure. Heck, I still remember reading an interview with Sandra Bullock when, oh gosh, this was in the 90s, you know, after Speed and she was becoming a big thing. And they had an interview with her and they also did a bunch of photos where they dressed her up like all these old movie stars. And she didn't know who any of them were. And I remember reading that and thinking, you're in the movies. How can you not know anything about movies? That's astounding to me. I you know, teach their own. If it's not your interest, you know, you just want to do the acting. It's just, But it just, to me personally, it doesn't make sense. Moving on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Moving on. Okay, so I'm a movie fan. But one thing I definitely like are the weird little movies. Like, they don't have to be deep and artistic or anything. But I just, I like the weird little movies, the quirky ones. Needless to say, I'm a big fan of Everything Everywhere All at Once. I saw that and was just like, oh my god, life-changing, right? And I was one of the first wave of people to see it before it had become this talked-about thing. So I was one of the people talking about it. I'm like, you gotta go see it. You just, I can't explain it. You gotta go see it. <laughs> However, that has since become a known quantity. So I'm not gonna touch on it here. I'm gonna focus more on movies that uh, a lot of people have not seen, but I have recently seen. So, yeah. So, no more digression. Ten! I mean, uh, ten, yeah. Weird little movies that you should definitely check out. Weird little movie number one. Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes. This is a Japanese one from a few years ago. And you can, well, you could find it on Prime. I found it on Prime. This is a charming little story about a cafe owner. He has uh, good friends who come to visit. And there's a girl uh, who works close by who he has a crush on. He's afraid to speak up. It all takes place in one night. And uh, that's pretty much it. Yep. Okay. So uh, thanks for coming. Bye. Okay. So there's also time travel involved. And this is very unusual for a time travel story. Because the time travel, he doesn't necessarily time travel, and neither does anyone else, unless you count in the typical linear fashion. What he finds one night when he goes up to his apartment, which is above the cafe, he turns on his TV and he finds out that somehow or another, he sees himself on the TV, he sees his friends on the TV, they're talking they're talking to themselves. Like, he can talk to himself through the TV. And what it is, is it's a portal from two minutes ahead in the future. And you will be amazed when you watch this movie how much of a difference two minutes makes. So much happens. So joined by his friends, they use the information fed to themselves from two minutes in the future. They use that information to woo the girl, to come into money, to get chased by the mob, and to confront death. The movie isn't all shot in one go, but it's one of those that has very long takes, which is insane because they're constantly going from the cafe where they hook up another TV so that they can talk to themselves and a camera. Of course, you have to have a camera so that you can talk into the camera and then 
send it to the TV. But they also go upstairs to the TV. There's a lot of back and forth. Just watching this movie will twist your brain into a Gordian knot, trying to follow it all. And I don't know how the filmmakers did it. When you watch the movie, make sure you watch the credits. I want to say the credits. I don't think there was a separate behind-the-scenes thing, but there was, I believe there was a behind-the-scenes video playing over the credits, and definitely watch it because at one point they show the, the script and the shooting schedule, and just the spreadsheets that they had to create in order to follow everything that goes on in this movie. It's insane. And I was in such a hurry to get this video out. I just realized that I've been filming without my microphone. I hope you could hear me. Can you hear me now? I've got it on now. I've got it on now. Yay, there it is. There it is, little guy. Weird little movie number two. Lamb. This is also from a few years ago. It is an Icelandic movie. Very serious note, no animals were harmed in the making of this film. But animal lovers, there may be um, a couple scenes that are a little hard to watch. Okay, so we're out in the rural Icelandic countryside. And there is a childless couple there working their farm, raising sheep and whatnot. Now, they weren't always childless. They did have a baby, and the baby unfortunately died. The it's not on not on film. I would have had trouble watching that. Um, but the action takes place after this has happened. The weird part comes in when one of their sheep gives birth to a half human, half sheep hybrid, just randomly. They figure it's a miracle and decide to raise it as their own. It works well for a while, and they become very tight knit as a familial unit. But outside forces are working to tear them apart. Will they survive? Well, you're going to have to watch the movie to find out. I'm not going to tell you. Oh, my gosh. Weird little movie number three. Rams. The 2015 version. I do not know what it is about Icelandic movies and sheep. What is going on in Iceland? There was a remake of this uh, a few years afterwards with Sam Neill. And I... I actually started to watch that one, and then it said, oh, it's based on this other film, and I was like, oh, okay, well, I want to watch that one first. I always like to watch the originals first if I can, so I stopped watching that, and then hunted down this other one, and I never got back to the Sam Neill one. I really should sometime. I mean, who doesn't like Sam Neill? Okay, so this movie is about two estranged brothers in rural Iceland, very popular place, uh, with competing sheep farms. They're not entirely alone. There's a whole bunch of sheep farms in this area. And disease sweeps through, causing a lot of farms to have to put down their sheep and wonder about the future of their livelihood. This affects one of the brothers. He ends up having to put down his entire flock, which he ends up doing on his own because he, he can't bear to have anyone else do it again. No animals were harmed in the making of this film, but it might be a little hard to watch if you're a serious animal lover. Anyway, secretly, he does keep a couple of the sheep and hides them away in his house because they're the last of a very strong line that's been around for forever and he simply can't bear to let them go. His brother finds out about this and joins him in keeping them secret because that line means a lot to their entire family. So again, we have Icelandic sheep farms uh, trying to band together as a family to keep out those pesky outside influences. So a very similar film, but not a similar film. Oh my gosh. Um, so yes, both very good. Oh, quick note about Lamb. I forgot to mention, this is that is a very symmetrical movie. Uh, Ram's not so much, but Lamb is a very symmetrically... Um, mo very symmetrical movie cinematography. Anyway, it's, it's not, uh, symmetrical in like a Wes Anderson type of way, but still, it really helps if you're sitting right in the middle of the screen to watch it. Like I had to keep adjusting myself from my regular spot on the couch so that I could watch it properly. Weird little movie number four. The Wall. This has nothing to do with Pink Floyd, or, uh, well, I don't think it does. I'm not a Pink Floyd fan. 
Um, this is a German movie. It is about a woman who goes into the countryside with uh, friends, relatives, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, they have this little cabin, well-stocked little cabin that they're going to stay at for a little bit. Her friends go into town, and she stays at the cabin. Then she goes for a walk in the woods, and she's just walking along the path when all of a sudden she's stopped by this invisible see-through wall. She can't find a way around it. This wall, it turns out, extends pretty much as far as she can walk at that, wherever she goes. There it is. It extends quite far, so she's got this big area, but still, it's a prison, and she can't figure out a way out. Nobody else appears to be trapped within this wall. She can see through it, and occasionally she'll see somebody, but it's like they're frozen in time. We don't know if there's a time dilation effect that is never answered. There is the occasional animal. So she ends up with animals to take care of, a cow to give her milk and such like. But mostly this is a movie about survival. Again, I should have mentioned before, there are a few rough scenes involving animals. No animals were harmed, but there are scenes where they appear to be, and it can be tough to watch. In any case, this is a movie about survival and the effect of loneliness on a person forced to be on their own. Interestingly, it's not a pandemic movie. I could have sworn it was by watching it, but it was made in 2012. How prescient is that the word? Weird little movie number five. Rubber. I think I found this on Max or Tubi or I don't know where I found it. Sorry, everything else I'm, up until this point has been on Prime. I should have mentioned that, but you know the way things skip around on streaming services? You just, you never know where you're going to find them anyway. Rubber. <laughs> it's a strange movie from the word go. I mean, right from the beginning, you're like, what is even going on here? Rubber is a movie about, and a movie about the movie, of a horror film about a spare tire that rolls around the countryside killing people. It's a self-aware, silly little horror film like you would expect it to be, but it takes it to the next level by being very meta about it. It's such an incredible level that it almost takes it to an art house level, but it's so aware of what a silly idea it is that I think that's what keeps it from crossing the boundary. It's just... Ah, I'm sorry, it's one of those I really can't explain. You have to watch it. It is a delight from beginning to end. Also not for kids because, you know, there's a tire killing people. And it gets a little gory. Weird little movie number six. Really, this is movies. It's the famous Living Trilogy by Swedish filmmaker Roy Anderson, consisting of three movies, Songs from the Second Floor, You the Living, and... A pigeon sat on a branch reflecting on existence. Now, unfortunately, I have not seen the first one. I couldn't find it on any streaming services whatsoever, nor on DVD, of course, being that is 2024. However, the, the second two are rather exquisite. <laughs> now, when people think, like lay people, think of full-length art house film as maybe the kind of thing they think of only a little more coherent, the action consists of a series of seemingly unrelated absurdist vignettes. And these are related by mostly white actors themselves in white face. It's a little hard to say what the movie's about, but the way I see it, the sum of the parts can be taken as a commentary on the pieces that make up the average white person's life experience, like the ridiculousness of what we create and perpetuate at the expense of everyone, including ourselves. It could be wrong, but, you know, that's art. You, you, you get out of it what you get out of it. We are little movie number seven. By the Hit. Possibly one of the most mainstream ones I've mentioned so far. 
Okay, so this one is a rather blatant treatise on death, life, and existentialism dressed up as this road trip yarn. Terrence Stamp is a guy who uh, was involved in criminal activity back in the late 60s, 70s, and he managed to avoid prison by selling out his friends, the rest of his gang. Years later, prison is done, and the bill has come due, and a hit has been ordered on him. John Hurt plays the hitman. And it's a very different sort of plot move indeed, in that the main character accepts his fate early on, or does he? It's never exactly clear. Now, there are two additional interesting things about this film. First of all, it's kind of a sequel of sorts to an early Terrence Stamp film called Sad Cow. It utilizes footage and circumstances from that movie. And the second thing that I found very neat is that almost every shot is set up in such a way that it looks like a painting. And this is not in an overly staged, overly noticeable Sidney Lumet kind of way. But even so, you could take most of the shots from this film and just hang them on your wall. Weird little movie number eight. Let's see, it's five, six, yeah, eight. Yakuza Apocalypse. If you think of Takashi Miike, this is probably the sort of movie you're thinking of. It's got some great absolute balls to the wall nuttiness from the knitting club in the basement to the giant frog. Oh, and violence, of course. A lot of violence and vampires. Uh, it's got Hayato Ishihara, who shows a decent amount of expression, which is not always his forte. And it's uh, also got Lily Frankie, uh, who shows up in the darndest places. Weird little movie number nine. Five, four, nine. Eo. Okay, this is one of those stories that you could probably call Odyssey-esque, but I have not, in fact, read the Odyssey, so I can't really call it that. I call them Alice in Wonderland type tales. These are stories in which the character is shuttled through a series of events, the circumstances of which are largely beyond their control. In this particular case, the main character is a donkey. Again, no animals harmed in the making of this film. There's not a ton of violence. There are a few parts that are disturbing. Um, and there are, there are some scenes where people are just basically jerks to this donkey. It's what is your problem? Also, this movie was directed by absolute legend Jersey Smolanowski. I trust I'm pronouncing that right, and I'm probably not. This is a Polish movie. I have a lot of foreign films on here. But I've been watching a lot of foreign films lately. It's great to expand your horizons and see what's different about the world, but more so than that, what strikes me is how much the same we all are. Like, we're all human, I think, right? Most of us have noses. Most of us breathe oxygen. I mean, how cool is that? And lastly, weird little movie number 10. The Ark of Oblivion. And this one is new, or pretty new. This one you are unlikely to find, unfortunately, on DVD or streaming <laughs> thus far. I saw it at a local film festival. This is a documentary about our wanting to leave a mark, something to remember us by. And I think that's funny because I've kind of touched on, on my videos, like the case for stuff, right? The stuff that makes you you, that's your representation of you to the world, right? And this is the stuff you leave behind. Now, this movie is hard to explain, so I'm going to read the description from the film festival website. The Ark of Oblivion explores a quirk of humankind. In a universe that erases its tracks, we humans are hell-bent on leaving a trace. Set against the backdrop of the filmmaker's chaotic quest to build an arc in a field in Maine, the film heads far afield to so salt mines in the Alps, fjords in the Arctic, and ancient libraries in the Sahara to illuminate the strange world of archives, record-keeping, and memory. Playfully weaving stop-motion animation, spellbinding cinematography, and fascinating interviews from the director's inner circle and experts in the fields of science, culture, and art, including documentarians Werner Herzog and Kristen Johnson, The Ark of Oblivion reveals how nature inspires the human drive behind filmmaking. And it just says how much of a film nerd I 
M and a nerd generally that I read that description and went, Oh, I, I have to see that movie that out of all the movies in this festival, that is the one I have to see, which is good. There was a standout because I didn't have time to see any more very busy weekend. So it is about that, but so much more. I remember particularly them touching on, um, this woman in, oh gosh, what was it? Bahamas, Barbados. There had been a huge hurricane that ripped through and her home was destroyed and pretty much all her memories, all her, everything that made her memories outside of her actual memory, her photos, everything, everything was gone. She was able to recover some photos from Facebook and that's all she had left. And if you've never lost everything like that, which I never have, not gonna look then it's something to think about. There was a lot to think about in that movie. It stuck with me. And that's great. Those are the movies I love. The ones that stick with me make me think about life and humanity. The ones like this documentary, which are touching on the stories that we tell ourselves, that we're going to keep our memories and, you know, after we're gone, we're going to leave a mark and tell people what we were like. And that's not true. Nothing lasts. But still, it is a story that we cling to. It is a story that we tell ourselves that we humans are going to leave our mark. We are going to leave a memory because we are worth remembering. I know that's an idea. I don't like letting go. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and I'm, I'm not meaning for that to be a, a downer of a thought or anything. I just, I think it's fascinating. It says something about who we are as humans. And on that note, who I am as a human is someone who's got to go and make dinner and do a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'm going to cut this video off here. I'm sure you have places to be and things to do as well. But I hope you take some of this with you to think about that you go and watch some of these movies at Slash when you can. Uh, and if you do, discuss them down below. If you have any movies to suggest, that by all means, I am always up for watching more movie youth, <laughs> learning more about humans and life because they are fascinating little creatures. We are. So I will see you next week. Yeah, fascinating little creature you. You have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, and I will see you next time. Bye!